Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series for um, the months of, of uh, July, August, and September of 2016 is entitled, The Role of the Church in the Community. So think about what that might be. This particular lesson focuses on urban ministry in the end time. It's lesson 12 in this series for September 17 of 2016. We hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to look at a number of passages and we're going to bring up some challenging ideas on how to deal with a major issue <coughs> that the church faces. But before we do that, we'd like to ask you to join us as we have a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, these are all your children. They're not our children. They're your children. But we would like to find better ways to reach out to them in their busy schedules and their, um, many of them don't, not even believing in you or not sure exactly that you even exist. But Lord, we know that you weep over them when they take that kind of an attitude. But use us if we can to reach out to them in ways that will be meaningful and perhaps bring some into your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the greatest challenges of the Christian church, not to mention the Adventist church in the 21st century, is the cities. Masses of people. Um, in fact, well, we've looked at this passage before. It should be very familiar to all of you, but let me just read it once again. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. So that, even read superficially, that says God wants us to go flood the earth, right? Doesn't that sound like it? We're supposed to be carrying the three angels' messages everywhere. But as we know, as of 2007, the United Nations statistical report said more than 50% of the world's population live in cities. What's the problem with cities? They have Green River ordinance. <laughs> Well, that's not their biggest problem. There's all kinds of problems. Social problems, getting people to mix and get out of their enclaves, clean water, adequate food, medical care. I was yeah. going to ask, do you think M Mrs. White envisioned the size of the cities we've got right here in America and elsewhere? Cause I don't see how she could have. And I mean, no. and, I mean, you take a city like Mexico City, yeah. 30 million people. 30 million people. I think You could lose the whole Adventist church in there. You could lose your life just going <laughs> in there the first time you're in there. This is what I'm getting at. Yeah. It's one thing to be in, in, in a dangerous area, but some of these places you don't go. You're going to have to use video stuff and radio. Whatever yeah, you. yeah. Well, and I ask another question. Um, we only read the first couple of verses of the Three Angels' Message, but I'm willing to bet there are few Adventists that know how to explain the Three Angels' Messages in a biblical context that makes sense. I mean, you know, I, I grew up with the Three Angels' Message. We used to say to someone who joined the church, so-and-so has accepted the Third Angels' Message. I had a clue and when I was a kid what in the world that was supposed to be all about. Well, so are we carrying the right message? Or is it we don't have enough willing messengers? Or could it be that God is expecting us to use modern media to accomplish it? I mean, what are the young people using these days? God exists Social media. It. What? God exists without it. Yeah, exactly. So what are we doing to, to reach out to them? Well, cities are complex in many ways. 
Many, many of the world's large cities are made up of different cultures, ethnic groups, languages, and religions. In times past, major cities tended to be organized into cultural or language quarters. There, you know, we all know about places that were Chinatown, and there was little Tokyo, there was little Mexico, little Korea, Koreatown. But now people are scattered around downtown and in the suburbs with all kinds of people living next door to one another. Well, in some cases, that might be an advantage. People are more willing to listen to other people's ideas and thoughts, maybe even willing to consider a new religion. However, with the media the way it is, I mean, do you find the media in our world today um, favoring Christianity? They're doing just about everything. I mean, Christianity is being knocked in every possible way. You know, Christianity is awful because it's, well, and there are some Christians who, who have done awful things. I mean, what a surprise. That doesn't mean, well, just like there are some Muslims who are doing awful things. Does that mean every Muslim is bad? I hope not. Um, so, looking for biblical examples, what cities would you turn to in the Bible? Cities, big cities. What was the biggest city in, around the Mediterranean in Jesus' day? Nineveh was a good size. Rome. Rome. Yeah. Rome was the biggest city in, in Jesus' day. Jesus never got there. Jesus never got there. Do we know what the second largest city was? It was Alexandria, wasn't it? Alexandria down in Egypt, the third largest city? Anti <laughs> Antioch, I, I here. <laughs> Antioch in Syria, and some people say the fourth largest was was Ephesus, but we're not so sure about that. These are these are calculated guesses, but something like this. How many of those places did Paul go to? Two All of them except yeah. Alexandria. Alexandria yeah. Well, that's right. He went to Rome. Hmm. All of them except Alexandria. So, and what was Paul's experience? Well, we know that he spent a fair amount of time in Corinth. That was a big city with all kinds of evil influences going on. He spent all, even more time in Ephesus, which is city number four in our series. Um, what did he do there? Well, he came to the city. He, he settled in with a group of a husband and wife team that were doing tent making because he knew tent making. He worked with them for a while. He taught in the synagogues in the synagogue that we know about. There may have been more than one. When he was thrown out of there, he moved to a Gentile's house. He said, it, when I'm with Jews, I, I act like a Jew. When I'm with Gentiles, I act like a Gentile. They tried, to, they tried to stop him by some legal means and took his case to court. And the Roman guy in charge of the court by the name of Gallio threw him out, said, this is ridiculous. This is not what this court is for, to argue about some religious stuff. Wow. So, and then he went, you know, he took these, this couple with him and headed back. He wanted to go back to the city of Antioch, and on the way he passed through Ephesus, and he left them there. People there wanted to hear more about the gospel, and Paul says to Aquila and Priscilla, would you be willing to sit here? Yeah, okay, we'll just stay here. We'll stay here. Um, they had come from Rome, they came to Corinth. They worked for a while in Corinth. Now they're in Ephesus, and later on they actually went back to Rome. So, um, he spent a lot of time in cities. What, can we learn anything about what Paul, how Paul related to cities? Well, he went there and he was a tent maker. Mm -hmm. So, somebody was buying the tents. Yeah. Somebody was get, having the tents repaired. I mean, he had an automatic um, contact in terms of how to, how to make contact with people over and above just the synagogue. Yeah. Who was the biggest purchaser of tents in Paul's day? Probably the military. The military, the Roman government. <coughs> yep. Well, then there was a then there was Alexand then there was Apollos. Where did Apollos come from? Alexandria. Alexandria. So now we've got we've got the fourth big city, don't we? Alexandria. He came to Ephesus and he ran into Aquila and Priscilla who said you know, there's part of your gospel story that you need to update. <laughs> and, and so they, 
Well, it's, 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 a, it's a credit to Apollo that he didn't think, well, I know all the answers, and you people are just a couple of laymen. He learned from them, and he went on, then he went on, he went on to Corinth. And Paul later said, you know, I saw, planted the seed, and Apollos watered it, but who gave the growth? God is the one who caused the growth. And another issue that's in the big cities is what about, especially in places like Southern California, what do you, how do you deal with different language groups? Have a Pentecostal day. Have a Pentecostal, <laughs> yeah, that would be Big good. Tongues. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think that would go over with I'm, some of our denominational brother. I, I, <laughs> well, there are many people who are bilingual. Yeah. So they, of course, would be able to go in and, well, and deal with, with and those who speak the same language. Last week, and, and aren't we doing that? I mean, mm -hmm. we have Spanish churches and Chinese churches and mm -hmm. Korean churches and Vietnamese Japanese churches and churches. Indonesian churches, so we've got that down pat. Sub Subunits of the University Church here in Loma Linda, we have almost every language you can, all the major languages anyway, the, that you can think about. So we've got that problem solved, do we? Well, maybe in Loma Linda. <laughs> I wouldn't say Loma Linda is one of the biggest metropolises in the world. <laughs> well, one of the things that, I, that, um, that I've been thinking about with all of this is that, for me, I cannot be all these different languages, all these different people, all these different locations, all these different needs. I think what we really need are teams out of, out of churches, out of whatever, I have a very special burden for children and what happens with children, especially foster children. And then the other is, is for women, um, mm -hmm. homeless women, women who have been through all kinds of rough times. And that's some place where I'm willing to put my energy. I'm not going to learn everything about every place around. Yeah. So what we really need to do is take a look at what kinds of things move our hearts what kinds of things um, we, we have knowledge and, and um, capabilities to do a competent job on some of those yeah. things. Well, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul sort of echo echoes your, your idea somewhat. He says, while working with Jews, I live like a Jew in order to win them. And even though I myself am no subject to the law of Moses, I lived as I were when working with those who are in order to win them. In the same way, when working with Gentiles, I live like a Gentile outside the Jewish law in order to win Gentiles. This does not mean that I don't obey God's law. I'm really under Christ's law. We could have a long discussion about what he meant by that, but, uh, but you get the general idea. So, unfortunately, the large cities tend to be very lonely, hurting places for a lot of people. There are more people, more buildings, more traffic, more problems. In recent times, there have, been a there have been terrible massacres, and one of those massacres was just a few miles from us here. How can we reach out to those who are hurting? Could we demonstrate the compassion, grace, and hope that Jesus demonstrated? Are we capable of that? I think the really, the key here, I believe, is to have some kind of a point of contact to find out what are the identified needs in, the, in whatever particular part of the population that you choose to mm -hmm. or feel drawn to, to work. If, if I am um, doing something with, let's say that I want women to feel better about themselves and so we're going to do hair and, and you know clothing, wait a minute, what about their health needs? What about mm -hmm. food? What about a safe shelter? I need to know because I listen what, what the need is. And mm -hmm. from that point, we can move farther into, you know, into, into a spiritual realm, mm -hmm. into um, all kinds of things. But we have to know first. Yeah. Well, and what you're suggesting is what our, one of the things our lesson goes into. <coughs> the best way to reach people is to understand their needs. If, if they don't feel a need in a certain area, you're trying to help them with whatever it is, and they don't feel a need, probably you're not going to make a very big impact on their lives. But if you, if you understand their situation and you, understand, you see their needs and you say, well, there's a solution to that need, let me see if I can help you, they tend to be, oh, all ears, you know. Um, 
reach, hurting people will, will reach out to almost any kind of help they can get. So what about Adventist churches? Are we prepared to um, reach out to people's needs? There are some Adventist churches who do a worthy thing. They prepare Thanksgiving baskets once a year and give to the poor. Well, that's good, but uh, the poor don't eat just on Thanksgiving. Would it be, <laughs> would it be even better to um, do as Diane does, tries to help, and others try to help people on a regular basis? Maybe you'd like to have a hot breakfast every morning. I have been criticized sometimes, and people, well, I'm, I'm always there on Wednesday, and we don't serve breakfast on Thursday, Friday, or Sunday. So it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sabbath. And this one guy was like, what am I going to do on Thursday and Friday? It's like, <laughs> we're here Sabbath, Saturday. We're here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. What am I going to do? We're here. This is when we're here. I There are other you know, give them information about some other places where might might be able to help. Because yeah. No so one if we had more volunteers, all. would those other days then be open? Is that why we're not open seven days a week? Or? That's probably a huge factor. We're struggling on whether or not we're going to be able to stay open over the summer because of the number of volunteers needed. Mm -hmm. so we may go we may go dark for for a month or so. Well, Matthew 13, verses 3 to 9 and 18 to 23 is a very familiar passage talking about, maybe I'll just read briefly, you know, you know the story. Once there was a man who went out to sow corn. As he scattered, and this is, I'm reading a British translation, so corn is wheat, really. As he scattered the seed in the field, some of it fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some of it fell rocky ground where there was little soil. The, swords, the seed soon sprouted because the soil wasn't deep, but when the sun came up, it burnt the young plants and so forth. Some of the seed fell among the thorny bushes and so forth. Well, so we're, this is a passage that we've heard sermons about. <coughs> Hopefully we're all very familiar with this uh, information. So, in an agricultural setting, Jesus used a familiar story to make it clear that people are going to respond in different ways to our message, and even to our efforts to help them. In big cities, there are even more varieties of people, of needs, of languages, of cultures, than there are in rural areas. And you can be in a rural area and you meet the, the, the recognized needs in that community, you might think, well, you know, we, we've solved the world's problems. I, I shouldn't tell a funny story about myself, but I, I went to a small little rural uh, Adventist school, and by the time I graduated from the eighth grade, I'd read every book in our library maybe twice or three times, some of them in terms of that, and I thought, well, you know, I know just about there everything there is to know <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and I discovered after going through high school and college and medical school that the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. So. Well, in certain areas, in certain cities, it is necessary to prepare the soil. You can't just go in and hold an evangelistic series. You might get bombed, or who knows what. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, Jesus, ta I mean, I'm sorry, Paul talks about that as well. In 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4, we don't have time to read those passages, but he talks about the spiritual gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And what are some of those spiritual gifts? Do you remember? The last one is encrotia, self-control, right? Well, that's, that's, the, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, fruit of the spirit. What about okay. the gift of Spiritual the Spirit? Gift, okay, teaching and Teaching, so -so. and he starts out with apostles, apostles yeah. and prophets, prophets and so forth like that. And then, he goes, and then the, the, the list sort of split up. He didn't stick to just one list. But it, it's a variety of things. So Ellen White's comment was many men of, and women, too, of varied gifts are to be brought in. One man is not all the gifts required for the work. To make a camp meeting, and this is an evangelistic effort, successful, several workers are needed. No one man should feel that it is his prerogative to do all the important work. New methods must be introduced. Is this where the social media come in or where the internet comes in? Well, God's people must awake to the necessities of the time in which they are living. God has men whom he will call into his service, men who will not carry forward the work in the lifeless way in which it has been carried forward in the past. 
That's an indictment. <laughs> <laughs> Many who have not yet heard the message to be given to the world have learned the meaning of self-denial self and self-sacrifice. Men will accept the truth who will work with earnestness and zeal, tact, and understanding. Let none discourage these zealous workers. In some things, they will, be, they will make mistakes and will need to be corrected and instructed. Review and Herald, September 30, 1902. Well, what about it? We're, we're on satellite TV. Is that one of the new methods? Yeah, I think so. We're doing our part. Uh, well, we're doing something. Does that mean we don't have to do any more, Jay? Jay <laughs> <laughs> doesn't want to talk on the airplanes. <laughs> when he moves away, he's going to have to come up with something new. <laughs> yeah. Well, th the sad part is that this. we have sometimes held fairly expensive large campaigns in, in cities and places around the world. And sometimes we've baptized even thousands of people. And if you come back a year later, how many of those people are still in the church? Not many. Sometimes it's and a... who stayed with them yeah. and continued the, you know, the friendship, the, you know, the, the grounding, the... Um, making them a part of the church community rather than just, oh, you're baptized, there you go. Let me read you four verses that are recommended by our Bible study guide. First is John 15, 12, and 13. My commandment is this, love one another just as I love you. The greatest love a person could have for his friends is to give his life for them. Now, Jay, I'm not going to suggest that you do that right now. Good. James 127, what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering, there you go, Diane, and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. And one more passage, Galatians 6, 2, help to carry one another's burdens and in this way you obey the law of Christ. So, what does that tell us about reaching out to cities? Are we going to be able to fill the world's, the furrow of the world's needs, as sometimes the term is used? Well, you can get overwhelmed. Back to what Diane was reacting to is if you make a huge list of everything we're supposed to be doing, you could get so uh, overwhelmed that you do nothing. Uh, you have to, you know, come back and think, what can I do? You know, mm -hmm. what's in my hand to do and start with that. Well, it's been demonstrated and we've talked, had other whole lessons on this. The most effective means of bringing people into the gospel is always the personal effort. But personal effort requires a lot of people doing a lot of things. My little old Bible study group's not going to do much in big old New York. Well, or even here in Southern California, the might. stretches all the way from Santa Barbara to San Diego. Yeah. A solid city. Yeah. <clears throat> well, small group ministries are often the best approach. Sometimes they take the form of house churches. Remember what it says in Acts 2? Do we have any of this going on in our day? Acts 2.46. Day after day they met as a group in the temple, and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts. In verse 47, I'm going to go on. Praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And every day the Lord added to the group those who were being saved. Now where was this? Where was this happening? This is a, in Jerusalem. So they were able to, to go to the temple and, and do what they were wanting to do there. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, in, you know, it, it, it surprises me as the, with the animosity of the priests and elders that they were able to go for so long. I mean, they went, they were going to the temple virtually every day, preaching the truth about Jesus for three and a half years before finally there was a big outcry and the, this, it, the, the Christians had to, had to leave. Af that was after Jesus was dead and raised and gone back to heaven. Well, some that were added were some of the priests and, and rulers mm -hmm. as well that came to him. So... It, it wasn't 
and they were so they were speaking up at that time. So it wasn't quite as clear cut <coughs> as it had been. Where every, it seemed that everybody was against Jesus at mm -hmm. one time. Now there was probably more division. Acts two forty seven says they had the favor of all the people. How did that happen? They certainly didn't have the favor of the priests and rulers. Well, could a, a group of three or four families get together and have a Bible study and start inviting their neighbors in? Would that work? It's happened mm -hmm. even close to here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And shouldn't one be prepared you know, it, often God starts, he, you know, he plants, he plants the seeds <clears throat> and then pretty soon it grows and it grows and you've got a big garden there. Shouldn't one, if one is going to embark upon this, be aware that, that this may actually grow and... Let's hope. And, and, and require more of, of the person's investment may grow very big. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I can't, I can't define exactly the specifics of how that might be, but I, I kind of think that's the way God likes to work a lot. I mean, I, I would just give my personal example, because we're <coughs> talking about personal examples. Many years ago, Many years ago now, I was asked to conduct a, a book by book class through the Bible for one of the local Adventist churches. I thought, okay, I, can, I probably can do that. Well, it has taken up most of my spare time from that day until this <laughs> into all this stuff, including Sabbath school classes and so forth. And some non-spare time also. And some non-spare time. Well, look at Paul's comment in Romans seven fourteen. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now, this is, this, is a Paul, this is Paul speaking after he has ministered for a long time, after he's, I mean, been through incredible shipwrecks and imprisonments and all kinds of things for the gospel, and he still says he's unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin? If Paul can make that kind of statement, what, what, what should we say? Is well, he's, go ahead, Dennis. Well, I, I think he's talking about, uh, as, like in verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So he's equating me with his flesh. He's mm -hmm. not talking about his total experience. He's talking about what he by himself is capable of. I see. So that's, that's how I see that. Because when you get to the end of the chapter and go into chapter 8, there's a whole different... Uh, you know, this seems like doom and gloom, but then he gets to uh, who will set me free, um, Jesus yep. Christ. And, and then he, he just opens up mm -hmm. and, and uh, talks about that. Is, is there another veiled message there, Ken, in that sometimes we are hesitant to embark upon these kinds of endeavors because we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. We're not smart enough. We don't have the deep theological training and expertise that a, a pastor has, mm -hmm. or even maybe the head deacon, or it's just us. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe when we read that passage, we often read it with, you know, another another emphasis. But maybe there's there's but a little emphasis there that, you know. I Dr. Maxwell used to talk about a, a rel relatively <laughs> uneducated guy who decided to start, to start a book by book class back in the middle, mid, mid section of the United States. And he, he, would, he would get the group around on one evening a week and says, what do y'all folks think of this here book? <laughs> 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 I mean, you know. Well, some of that comes from fear though. You know, your fear, mm -hmm. fear of failure and such. But uh, Paul, no, it's John's, uh, perfect love casts yeah. out fear, it's John. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, First John two so eighteen. So the more we love, the, the less we're going to be concerned yeah. about. Uh, well, I think one thing is very clear: God is wants to do everything possible to win as many people as possible. 
And he says that, 2 Peter 3, 9 and 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. So if we're working to try to win souls, who do we have to help us? Or who are we helping? Maybe I should put it that way. Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but when we think about that, we think not working in our, in our own little frailty. We're expecting all kinds of power and all kinds of knowledge and all kinds of... That's our standard, and, and we, don't, we don't... Did Jesus say we have to have all that? Well, no, but <laughs> we don't. Yeah, well, God won the great controversy all by himself by decisively refuting every one of Satan's claims against him. Now, what, what reason is there why we can't go out and tell that to people? We don't have to, we don't have to claim to be any supernatural Well, yeah, but expert. you know, they don't just sit there and take it like a lump. <laughs> <laughs> Soak it all in. Why not? They look at it as kind of weird. Some people will say, as you mentioned in our last lesson study, mm -hmm. talked about this guy that said, this, this theologian who was head of a seminary, well, I don't even believe in the devil, you know. Yeah. So it's not like they're just going to accept everything mm -hmm. we, we say or we present as if it's honey dripping off right off the comb. We're, <clears throat> we're going to meet some, we might read some resistance and, un, and uncomfortable things. Well, is that in, you have that in your text there? Jesus said <laughs> as much that if they hate me, they'll hate you, you know. Yeah. So things will be rough. But Paul says in Romans 10, verses 14 and 15, but how can they call to him for help if they have not believed? And how can they believe if they have not heard the message? And how can they hear if the message is not proclaimed? And how can the message be proclaimed if the messengers are not sent out? As the scripture says, how wonderful is the coming of messengers who bring good news. So, so how, can I, how can I develop the, the self-confidence or the courage or whatever I need to overcome my, as Dennis said here, my my fears yeah. of, of being rejected, being, not, of saying the wrong thing, not being able to be very, uh, very well, eloquent or, or it, knowledgeable it, about these yeah. objections these people bring. Yeah. I, you know, not to be saying a lot about myself, I've already talked maybe too much about myself, but I can say that you can look on our website. We have a website called Theological Crossroads, or Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You go there, and you can get a, a study guide for every book of the Bible. Every book of the Bible. And sit it down there, sit down there, and you can, you can look at the questions. There's a student, student study guide, and there's a teacher study guide, and it has answers to the questions for the student study guide. And You don't have to be, you know, some kind of theological guru. You know, the help is right there. And the, the, and the point is not to have the answer to everything. The, the point is, read the Bible and what do, what do you think of that? What do you think of that? You know, let, let's share what we, when we read this passage, what does it tell us about God? And to take confidence that you're not alone, the Holy Spirit is there too. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. And, and um, is helping. I, I find very often when I'm teaching that God will say, you know, something will come out and say, where did that come from? And I, I, I can't explain it. I, I think that God often brings, the discussion comes around in a certain way and it leads to a certain point. I thought, man, that's wonderful. Where did it come from, you know? And to those who haven't done anything like this before or hesitant because they feel, you know, there is, um, there is some skill. Mm -hmm. And the more, you, the more you do it, the more you're better at it. Mm -hmm. Well, Ellen White says, Medical Ministry, page 304, there is no change in the messages that God has sent in the past. The work in the cities is the essential work for this time. 
when the cities are worked as God would have them, the result will be the setting and operation of a mighty movement such as we have not yet witnessed. Wow. How would that, what would that look like? Well, and, and, and I can hear some people who are faithful Adventists and have read a lot of Ellen White saying, but aren't we told to get out of the cities? Yeah. I really think that um, we have stayed out of the cities because that was, that was what Ellen White said, stay out of the cities. All, and So I don't think we should be beating ourselves up for saying we're not in the cities. You know, the times are different now. The times are changed. The, um, the, the need cities is, are worse. I, <laughs> yes, but the need is greater. The need continues to be greater. And um, well, did, you, did you say stay out of the cities or did you say don't live in the cities? Well, here, what, and I'm going to, the, uh, there's a church historian that did a study and it's quoted in our Friday, a section for Friday, out of 107 articles about cities and how we should relate to cities, 24 of those articles gave instruction on moving out or establish, establishing institutions outside cities. So get out, establish the institution outside the cities. But 75 articles gave specific instructions to move into the cities to reach the cities. The other eight articles were, were so more or less neutral. So, how does that sound? A church historian summarized Ellen White's counsel on city work, showing that relating to institutions, she advocating working from outpost centers outside the city. And when dealing with local church work, she advocating working from within the city. So if you're there, if you're trying to set up a new hospital or a new you know, college or something like that, do it outside the city. But if you're trying to reach the people in the city, you've got to be in there getting to know them and working with them. So do we balance out the numbers of how many references say this versus how many say that? Do we carry that to other things like, you know, if, know. if we do, the great controversy is not in very many places in the Bible and other views are much more, seemingly much more referenced. So. You know, we have to put it all together. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the number of articles, we have to see what they actually say. Yeah. Well, or you, or you can have like in Hangzhou with Saran Ranshaw Hospital. When that hospital was first built, it was farmland all around. And now it's in the middle of the city because yeah. the city grew out. Well, to it. look at, I mean, how many hospitals, uh, well, how many colleges and hospitals and so forth that the Adventist church has built are like that. Mm -hmm. we, used to use, we used to joke in Africa that uh, if you want to establish an Adventist institution, you'd go into the rail line and three days walk and then you start a hospital or a church. And uh, there's some, a lot of places that are like that, but now there's whole communities around those places. So, what plans are your church making to reach out to cities in your area? Are you located somewhere close to a major metropolitan city? Well, Ellen White said these words again, why should not families who know the present truth settle in these cities? There will be laymen who will move into cities that they may let the light which God has given them shine forth to others. That's pretty clear, I think. Should we be moving in the city, into the cities, until things become really difficult for city dwellers? Well, church-going, Bible-believing city dwellers? Well, I, I think there's practical concerns. You know, a lot of times she, she emphasized how things need to be practical. And if, mm -hmm. if you, you know, how do you find a rural area near Los Angeles? You know, I, I remember some <laughs> friends of mine, they, uh, they, they worked for The Voice in Glendale, but they wanted to live somewhat in the rural area, so they went up to Big Tahunga Canyon, but they spent most of their day commuting. So on Sabbath, they, you know, on the weekend, they had some rural 
uh, ambiance. But uh, during the rest of the week, it was you got home and you <laughs> got to sleep and got up and came back again. I'm always a little bit amused that we have an institution called the White Memorial when she said so many times, do not settle in the Los Angeles area. Put your institutions outside. Anyway. It might have been more rural at the time it was established. It probably was, but not very far. <laughs> well, okay, so let's, let's in, the, in the few minutes we have left, what can we do with 50, more than 50% of the world's population in cities? What are we doing in Beijing? Well, I can tell you that I had, we had a very interesting experience when one time I'd been to Beijing. My wife was asked to come and teach some classes in China at Sir Run Run Shaw. And then later we decided to spend a few days in, in Beijing. And we had a very, very competent, wonderful guide that showed us around the city and took us to all kinds of places. And we had an Adventist couple say, we, we'd contacted them before and said, when, you, when you're there on Sabbath, make sure you go to the Adventist church. Well, there's no Adventist church per se, but there's a place where Christians can meet, and the Adventists meet there on Sabbath. Says, and here's the address. Well, in fact, he didn't even give us the address, just said this is the name of the place. And so after we'd been with this guide for a few days, we said, you know, we're trying to find this place and this whatever. Do you think you could help us? And this guy went home and researched, I don't know how long on the internet, Came back the next morning, he says, I'm pretty sure this is the place you're looking for. Here's the address. He says, you know, and he wrote it all down for us in Chinese. He said, Take, go, find, get yourself a taxi. Show him this, this number, this, this card, and he'll take you there. Well, it turned out that this is a place behind another building. There's just a little walkway that goes back there. But a big area and, a, and, a, and, a, and quite a church. And we went in there and... Boy, they were there, and when you walked in the door, you were assigned seats because it, there was no leaving any space. That place was chock-a-block full. Every single space was taken, and then there was an overflow room with a TV feed, a, you know, line. That place was full. So even places like Beijing, gospel is reaching out somehow or other. Well, are we ready to participate in Jesus' model of holistic ministry? What is holistic ministry? Spelled with I a wrote W. That down as a question. How do you define holistic ministry? <clears throat> well, he met people's needs physically, physically mentally, spiritually. socially, and spiritually. And that's spelled W H O L. Yes, W H O L. Not, not H O L. <laughs> yeah. Right. Whole person care. Whole person care, yes. Well, considering all the sin that is in great cities, how does God feel about them? You remember the story of Jonah in Nineveh? And at the end of Jonah's book, he said, God, speaking to Jonah, says, How much more then should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city? After all, it has more than 120,000 innocent children in it, as well as many animals. It's amazing. And what was the reputation of the Ninevites? You remember? Bloodthirsty kind of rolling town, wasn't it? They worshipped the god of war. That was their thing. <clears throat> they, would, they would sometimes beat people, enemies, till they were black and blue and then skin them alive. That right? sounds like what you see in the newspapers today or the, on the <laughs> internet. Really? This ISIS stuff. Mm -hmm. right? Well, Ellen White had this comment to say, and in, in, uh, in 1909, there is another line of work to be carried forward, the work in the large cities. There should be companies of earnest laborers working in the cities. Men should study what needs to be done in the places that have been ne neglected. <coughs> the Lord has been calling our attention to the neglected multitudes in the large cities, yet little regard has been given to that matter, the matter. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 537. And some of you out there um, will be teaching Sabbath school classes, and maybe you'd like to have access to our materials that we use here in class. They're available also on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X.org, and you can get a handout for 
this lesson when you study it or when you talk about it in, in your class. What about, there's a very interesting passage in, found in Jeremiah 29.7. I'm going to read it here. Work for the good of the cities where I have made you go as prisoners. Pray to me on their behalf, because if they are prosperous, you will be prosperous too. <coughs> Jeremiah 29.7. Who's writing that and to whom? Well, we know it's in the book of Jeremiah. Where was Jeremiah? Jerusalem. He was in Jerusalem. Who was he writing to? Those the in captive. Babylon. Yeah, the captives in Babylon. The captives in Babylon. How did, how did Jeremiah get his message to the captives in Babylon? Sent it by internet. Yeah. <laughs> well, there seemed to be some communication uh, between the two, back yeah. and forth, when you read through Jeremiah. Yeah. And Daniel also mentions that uh, in, the, in chapter 9, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books of the number of the years which had been revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jer Jerusalem, na namely 70 years. So yeah. Daniel had in his possession uh, yep. at least some of Jeremiah's writings. So God told the exiles, I mean these are, these are people in exile. They've, they've lost their property, they've lost their place. They're you know, probably having to work for the Babylonian government. He tells them, settle down, pray for the peace of the city where you are living, carry on normal activities. He had already told them in two places that we know of in the book of Jeremiah, you're going to be there for 70 years. And Daniel, you quoted Daniel, picked that up. Sometimes their captors would come to them and say, sing to us one of those songs of Zion. How would you feel about that point about singing a song to Zion? Well, it would be a chance to witness. <laughs> well, yeah, possibly. I suspect it was said in sarcasm. Yeah, mm -hmm. unfortunately. I picture the organ grinder and the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, there's an old story told of a man standing under a street lamp, head down, intently looking for something. His friend David stops to help. What did you lose, John? He asks. I dropped my watch and can't find it anywhere. That's a shame, says David. Let me help. <coughs> so David drops to his hands and knees and for the next 10 minutes helps John look for his watch on the pavement under the street lamp. <laughs> Finally, after covering every last bit of ground several times, he turns to John and says, Are you sure you dropped it here? Well, not exactly here, John replies. Well, what do you mean, exclaims David. Where did you drop it? John points out into the darkness. About 20 meters over that way. David can't believe what he hears. You dropped it over there, but we've been searching here all this time? That's ridiculous. Why on earth have we been looking here? Well, that's obvious, says John. The light's better here. <laughs> Wasn't looking to find anything. Apparently was just looking because... Well, it was easier looking. to look. It's easier to look on where there's light. Yeah, exactly. Do we ever do that when it comes time to spread the gospel? Any of you ready to go and spread the gospel in Syria right now? There's a lot of people trying to get out of Syria. It's a dangerous place. Especially if you're a Christian. Yeah. Or a Yazidi. Well, just think of all the Miracles God could work in your ha behalf over there. You'd really catch a lot of attention if you were over there. and Maybe so. God was working miracles for you. Well, what are we doing to reach out to Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists and even atheists? Members of the secular society. Bankers and lawyers and how are we reaching out to those people? What are we doing to reach out to those who may not have a understanding of the three angels' messages or the or character the of God yeah. within the church. Or even yeah. heard, heard of the book of Revelation and those angels. And yeah. yeah. I, uh, <coughs> I, I will never forget an experience I had uh, several years ago now when the university church decided that we would have our own uh, parade of nations. 
let people come in and carry flags of different nations and come in and people could talk about their experience working overseas in different places. And most of the time was taken up by a gentleman who had worked in India. And he said the gospel is going like wildfire in India. At that point in time, the Adventist membership, the world, Adventist world membership was around 16 or 17 million. He said, the rate we're going, he says, before too long, before I die, I expect there'll be 16 or 17 million Indians who are Seventh-day Adventists. Now, why do you suppose that would be? What do you suppose made him say that? Because there's persecution in India. Persecution? That ought to make it more difficult. It seems to drive movement toward. Well, it turns out, now I don't I haven't checked on the statistics just recently, but in those days, a few years ago, it seemed like more Christians were being baptized in the places where it was against the law to change your religion. And there's some states in India where it's against the law to change your religion. Are we back to Tertullian's statement that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church? Well, what about in this country? Uh, I think we mentioned last time, at least raised the question, that it seemed that Christianity in this country was under a tremendous assault. So maybe we should ask those questions of what, what we're doing here in this country. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have a plan? Does our church have a plan to reach out to Hindus? and Muslims and Buddhists and even atheists for that matter. Usually it's on the back of the quarterly. There's some place we're raising money for to okay. evangelize so people. All like we have to do there. is read it on the back of the quarterly once a quarter? Sure. And Jay can donate his five dollars. <laughs> so he doesn't have to talk on the airplane. That's right. <clears throat> Well, the cities may seem like an almost impossible task to us. How do you suppose Jonah felt about war, the warlike Assyrians in Nineveh? I mean, th think, think about it. It was, it was 500 miles at least from where Jonah was to Nineveh. And he had to walk. And he went. He went away, he, and, I, and I like to remind people, he probably worked for the king. He was a professional prophet. Probably worked for the king. Second Kings, he'll tell you about that. So he sets out, and the idea, he must have told his friends, God has called me to go and preach to the Ninevites because he's, God is going to destroy that nation. Our worst enemies. So I'm going to get rid of the whole lot of them in one fell swoop. And he goes there and he preaches to Nineveh and they repent and he comes back and says, well, Jonah, did you do it? No, they repented. <laughs> I mean, you know. I knew you were that way. Yeah. I knew I knew they would, you were a soft He said that about God, didn't he? He had compassion on people and I knew you wouldn't do it to them. <laughs> Nahum tells us that the Ninevites were known for endless cruelty. Nahum 3.19. Well, Jesus often was exhausted from his long days of teaching, healing, and preaching. But when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So what are the biggest barriers that keep us from witnessing to people around us? Are some of those barriers our own prejudices and our own fears? I think it's mostly fears, fears that we don't have what it takes. Fears Are we worried about what God, what people will think about us or what, what, what people think about God? That's one of the things that Dr. Maxwell used to talk about and I give great respect to him. He says, don't go there and try to talk about Adventists. Don't go and try to talk about yourself, mostly. You can tell your personal experience. That'll get people's attention. But talk about God. You can get almost anybody to talk about God. It's amazing. You know, you mentioned 
I think last week that, you know, these atheists, how much they talk about God. You know? People love to talk about God. They may, some people may swear at him and whatever, but they want to talk about him. So, what are we going to do? It would be natural, if you think about the Jews in, in, in Jeremiah's day, it would, be, it would have been very natural, and maybe that's what, we, what they did, we don't know for sure, for them to go over there in Babylon and settle in one area where they can, you know, sort of settle in their own little ghetto, and, and it's easier to keep the Sabbath, and it's easier to get your kosher food, and it's easier to have fellowship, and so forth like that. What did God tell them to do? Settle down, spread out, mix with the Babylonians. Was that mix with the Babylonians so that you can become like Babylonians, or mix with the Babylonians so you can spread the word about God? Well, how many of the Jews finally left Babylon? One percent. One or two percent. They settled down permanently. And they and were there I, up until a few years ago. Yeah. The descendants were... Uh, Many Jews. There were huge, a huge Jewish community in Iran until the recent Muslim uprising. Well, also Iraq. In Iraq as well. Yeah. Yeah. Huge populations of them. Masoretic text is, was preserved in mm -hmm. Babylon, I think. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, one of the places, yeah. Well, the neglected. As a people we greatly need to humble our hearts before God, pleading His forgiveness for our neglect to fulfill the Gospel Commission. We have made large centers in a few places, leaving unworked many important cities. Let us now take up the work appointed us and proclaim the message that is to arouse men and women to a sense of their danger. If every Seventh-day Adventist had done the work laid upon him, the number of believers would now be much larger than it is. Testimonies, Volume 9. So, if you live near a city, think about that city. Think about the challenges in that city. Have you been there recently? Have you walked down the streets? Have you, have you talked to people to understand what their needs are? Think about it. Th consider a, a trip down and, and, and spend some time in the city and see if you can think of, you can find better ways to reach out to them because that's what God is calling us to do. Our kind and wonderful Father, you have laid before us a tremendous challenge. We know how difficult it is to reach people in the cities. They have their own agenda. They'd rather spend time in the movies and all kinds of other things besides listening to the gospel. And yet, half of the world's population are in those cities. So help us. We may find ways that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we may be guided to reach out to, for, to people that we are able to touch in their areas of greatest need and lead them back to you. Not our work, but your work. May we join you in your work as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.